got him to turn to America in 1981 and started teaching and lecturing on what he knew would reach our shores. After 40 plus years of study he taught, he has taught and lectured at various high schools, colleges, and for law enforcement agencies. Today he continues to lecture and speak publicly on terrorism, jihad, Sharia, and Islam. He has been a guest on the Sean Hannity as well as dozens of other shows quoted by Michelle Malkin, <coughs> Dr. Wally Ferris, I'm sorry, P-H-A- Oh, Wally Ferris. Yeah. The advisor to the Unitarian Caucus of the U.S. House of Representatives called his work uh, leading in the movement and the study of counterterrorism. He has written hundreds of articles that have been translated from Spanish to Vietnamese and host a weekly internet-based radio show, America Akbar, that is listened to all over the world. More information on Gotti Alderman can be found on the website, gottialderman.com. Uh, thanks for everyone coming tonight. Uh, and I'm going to turn everything over now to Mr. Gotti Alderman. Before we get started, anyone who is a veteran or active duty military, please stand up. Come on, there's got to be more than that. Thank you, everybody. Anybody who's law enforcement or former law enforcement, please stand up. Thank you, Jim Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> Rhodesian Special Forces and also former law enforcement, good friend Peter Baker. Um, we have the mayor and first lady of Franklinton sitting back there. Thank you. We have a chief of police sitting over here. I cannot thank everybody enough for coming out. I only wish we had more folks here so that people could be educated. My main thing is to educate. What we're going to try and do tonight, and I've had to condense it, and you'll understand why in a second. I'm going to try and explain from the year 623, when Islam was first formed, to current times. So we're only going to cover about 1,400 years in as short a time as possible. But I think we can do it. I've managed to condense this. So I want to thank Tommy and Joe. This was originally supposed to be in Tommy's living room. So it kind of grew when we ended up here. Um, and my other half is on her way here from the airport. and. Delta, uh, unfortunately, due to Delta, she got stuck in California, so she should be walking in any second. Let me just pull up my notes. Why do they hate us? I am not saying that all Muslims are terrorists. What I am saying is that there is no such thing as moderate Islam. Okay, everybody understand that. Not all Muslims are terrorists, but there is no such thing as moderate Islam. And through this presentation, you're going to learn why I say that through their own words, not mine. Everything that I'm going to teach you tonight that I'm going to speak on, you can go and check. And I want you to go and check. I want you to educate yourselves. And then pass that education on to others. There are plenty of Muslims who aren't actively furthering the cause of jihad, but that does not mean that there is a peaceful form of Islam or a non-supremist form of Islam. I don't use the term radical and moderate when it comes to Islam. You hear on the media, they always say radical Islam. Why doesn't the president say radical Islam? I don't say radical Islam. I say devout Islam, and there's a difference. The term radical was actually a phrase that was developed, it was coined by the Council on American Islamic Relations. That's a group here in the United States that's an arm of the Muslim Brotherhood. It was a fantastic marketing tool. Because in the English language, if you have something that's radical, thereby you have to have something that's moderate. So they stuck this term on it, radicalism. That's not us, we're the moderate guys. There is no such thing as radical Islam any more than there is moderate Islam. There's Islam, period. 
Now there's a difference between a devout Muslim and a non-devout Muslim. And that's where the factor is. And my favorite example to use would be that of Nadal Hassan. Everybody remember who Major Nadal Hassan is? Major Nadal Hassan was born and raised in Roanoke, Virginia. He went to elementary school there. He went to junior high school there. He went to high school there. He went to medical school. He was a patriot. Yes, you heard me right. He was a patriot. He joined the U.S. military. And then during his time in the military has been attested to in hearing after hearing by his fellow co-workers and soldiers, both his superiors and underlings, they saw a change where he started becoming more devout. And when he got to that point where he was devout, where he had printed on his own business card, S-O-I-A, nobody knew what that meant, Soldier of Islam Army, he was handing out business cards that had it right there. There were red flags all over the place. Unfortunately, people didn't know what it meant. That's the difference between devout and non-devout. One more example. Dee and I have a dear friend. His name is Hamidi Jassim. Has anyone heard of the book, The Terrorist Whisperer? If you haven't picked it up or read it, I know you bought a copy. Hamidi is, according to himself, a Muslim. He's a dear friend of mine that I would trust with my life, and I know he would trust his life to me. I call him brother. The day that Dee and I met Hamidi, the first thing out of my mouth, because I want to know what I'm dealing with, was are you a Muslim? And this was his answer, and I quote, <laughs> Yeah, I'm a Muslim. I've never read the Quran, and I've never stepped foot in a mosque. But I call myself a Muslim because my parents are. I don't worry about him. As a matter of fact, Hamidi Jassim, who grew up in Iraq, saved the lives of over a thousand U.S. soldiers working for our government undercover, which is why he's called the terrorist whisperer. He's not a Muslim any more than anyone in this room is, but he will tell you he is. And it's no different than the Christians we know who only show up to church at Christmas or Easter, or the Jews we know that haven't been to synagogue since they were 13 and they had their bar mitzvah. But they say, oh, I'm Jewish, or I'm Christian. You have Muslims like that, so we need to differentiate devout versus non-devout. That's my little rant. So why do they hate us? This is a recent picture. This is actually in England, where they have a much larger problem than we do here. But this is what's coming. Why do they hate us? What did we do to offend the Muslim world? The reality is that devout Islam started rising in 1928. It's not that long ago. In 1928, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the oldest Islamic terrorist organization in the world, was founded in Egypt. In 1928, we didn't have a foreign policy that was supporting Israel, <coughs> Israel because Israel didn't even exist. You know, people believe that this was caused because of our support for Israel or George Bush's policies. That's all false. And all one has to do is look at history to understand this has been going on since the beginning of Islam. We didn't do a thing to them. It has nothing to do with Israel. How could it? Israel didn't even exist in 1928. <clears throat> if it's not our foreign policy or our support for Israel, what is it? Why did the Muslim Brotherhood even begin in 1928? In order to understand it, you have to understand the life of the Prophet Muhammad, his teachings, the Quran, the Hadith, the Jinnah, the Qiyas, and the Sunnah. But unfortunately, most people don't know or understand the religion of Islam. The word Islam actually means, in Arabic, submission. That's the translation for the word. The Arabic term Islam is translated as submission. Submission of the desires to the will of God. It comes from the term in Arabic, Islamah which means to surrender or resign oneself. Who here has good eyes? Somebody commented here. You're in front of me. This is your holy Quran. Ooh, I forgot. 
You're supposed to wear a glove when you touch it if you're an infidel. <laughs> um, I can't get any more infidel. Read, loud enough for everybody to hear, read number 29. Right out of their book. Fight against those who look one, believe not in Allah, nor in the last day, nor forbid that which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger Muhammad. And those who acknowledge not the religion of truth, <laughs> among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, until they train their Jizya, Jizya, mm -hmm. Jizya, with willing submission, and feel themselves subdued. That's the inside of that, right? <laughs> I'm going to break that, that one paragraph down for you. Fight right. against those who do not believe in Allah. We wonder why they fight us? We wonder why ISIS says we are an Islamic group? I think Obama needs to learn what the I in ISIS stands for. <laughs> Fight those who do not believe in Allah. That's us, infidels, non-believers. Mm -hmm. Anyone who does not believe in Allah, fight against them. That is a commandment in the Quran. Uh, and those who do not acknowledge the religion of truth, the religion of truth is Islam. Among the people of the scripture, they're okay as long as they pay the jizya. Jizya is Arabic for protection tax. If you are a Jew or a Christian and you are living under Arab rule, there's 57 Arab nations out there. Not all, but most of them are under Islamic law, what they call Sharia. If you live under that as a Christian or a Jew, your taxes are going to be different than a fellow Muslim. Why is that? It's a protection tax. That's what the word means, protection. The government will protect you from being slaughtered, provided you pay this tax. And that's because, as we're going to get into this, Muhammad referred to Jews and Christians and people of the book. Now, if you're not a Jew or a Christian, if you're an atheist, if you're a Buddhist, if you're a Sikh, if you're anything else, you can forget it. You're either going to convert to Islam or you're going to die. That's your choices. Convert or die. That's in their book. Their words, not mine. And we're going to go over all that. Quran 933 is he, Allah, who sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth, Islam, in order for it to be dominant over all other religions, even though the mashrikun, that's Arabic for disbelievers, hate it. They're stating it right in their own book. Every time you see an imam or a Muslim on TV quoting lovely things out of this book, they're picking and choosing. Because there's this thing in the book where it actually says you're going to find parts where Allah has contradicted himself. And what you do is you have to, according to the book, take the last thing written about that subject as gospel. No pun intended. In other words, in the beginning of the book it says you have to love everybody, and at the end of the book it says you have to kill everybody, that book outranks it. And the Quran, and you can look this up, ask any Muslim you meet, is not in the order it was written. It was put together in a certain order. It's called abrogation. They did that for a reason. And it talks constantly about the contradictions of Allah's word in here, and how he's allowed to make mistakes. He's Allah. But you have to go after the last thing that he stated. 67% of the Quran is violence. The next time you hear someone say, oh, there's violence in the Old Testament, there's violence in the New Testament, look at what the Crusaders did. 67%, can you say that about the Bible, old or new? 67%, there are over 109 verses that call on Muslims to have war with the non-believers for Islamic rule. Their words, not mine. Some are graphic with commands to chop off heads, fingers, and kill the infidels wherever you find them. Does that sound familiar? Chop off their heads. I wonder where they get that from overseas when we see ISIS cutting the throats of people and decapitating them. Muslims who do not join the fight are hypocrites. And they are warned that Allah will send them to hell if they do not join the slaughter. Or you can actually take that one step further, as ISIS has done. If you're a hypocrite of the religion, you're an apostate. Does anyone here want to tell me what the penalty for 
for apostasy is under Islam. Say it out loud. Death. Yeah. Death. That's right. World. If you leave the religion, you will die. Because remember, Islam means submission. You're submitting to it. The source of Islamic law, the only official source for the Sharia, Islamic law, are the Quran, the Hadith, the Ijah, and the Qiyas. And, and if you want to know the Hadith, you probably heard that term thrown around. You may or may not know what it means. The Quran is Allah's word. <coughs> there are no words in here from Muhammad, their prophet. Muhammad was the one who got this book from the angel Gabriel in a dream and put it down on paper. But it's Allah's word according to the religion. The Hadith is the life and times of Muhammad. Muhammad, what he did, what he said, why he did certain things he did. So that's the book they look to to become as close as possible to the person they consider to be the most pious individual, Muhammad, their prophet. So that's where the Sharia law comes from, mostly. The Quran and the Hadith. Oh, you who believe, ask not questions about things which, if made plain to you, may cause you trouble. Some people before you did ask questions, and on that account they lost their faith. Quran 5, 101. Well, what does that mean? Everything is in here. Don't ask questions. You are not allowed to question anything in this book. It's all laid out for you. Your entire life is laid out for you in this book. And if you ask questions, if you doubt anything, that is losing your faith. And what happens if you lose your faith? It's apostasy. And what happens if you are an apostate? You die. It's very simple the way they did this. It, it really is if you think about it. Um, as far as where terrorism comes from, we find somebody else who can read. You got your reading glasses on? Okay. <laughs> it's very small. Who's got good eyes? You got good eyes? So we're going to give it to somebody. Nancy can read. Number 60? Starts with and make. Okay. And make ready against them all who work, all who can, all power, including steeds of war, tanks, planes, missiles, artillery, to threaten the enemy of Allah and your enemy and others besides whom you may not know, but whom Allah does know. And whatever you shall spend in the gods of Allah shall be repaid unto you, and you shall be treated unjustly. You shall not be treated unjustly. And I'm going to break this one down for you. Because in Arabic, the word irbum actually translates to terror, terrorize. And what Nancy just read for us, and thank you for picking up the image. What Nancy just read to us, where she said to threaten the enemy of Allah. Here's the actual translation from English, from Arabic to English. And prepare against them whatever you are able of power and of steeds of war by which you may terrorize the enemy of Allah and your other enemies. Terrorize. That's the actual word. Hopefully if we have time we're going to cover that too. So, um, hang on one second. I was going to say, please hold questions for the end. D, when the waitress comes in, there's food waiting for you besides that. There is? Yeah, ribs, nachos, and wings. What? <laughs> oh, good. And you guys can all share it. This is, this is uh, an art rendering of the Prophet Muhammad when he got his revelation from the angel Gabriel in the early 600s. In his dream, and that his religion of Islam was to be spread throughout the nations. So he began preaching to the people in Mecca, where he was living at the time. And this is real important. This is where we're going to touch on the early life of Muhammad. He went to the people in Mecca who were mostly pagan and he started preaching Islam to them. And for 12 years, for 12 years he tried to recruit followers. And the numbers on this vary as to how many followers he had after 12 years. But we do know by the Hadith, we do know 
that he was only able to recruit close friends and immediate family members. After 12 years, he had somewhere between 23 to 100 followers. That was it. Well, after 13 years, he decided he would go to the, to the next door town, which was named Medina. And he was going to, now at the time, you have to understand, the city next to Mecca, Medina, at that time was called Yertub, Y-E-R-T-U-B. And Yertub was a Jewish hub. It was full of Jews. It was, it was really the, the business area, if you will, of Arabia. So he decided, to, he thought to himself, if I don't preach to the Jews and they accept me, that will give me credibility with my own people. And that's when the Prophet Muhammad started borrowing things from the Old Testament, <coughs> practices and customs, in order to make his religion more palatable to the Jews and the crowds of year two. So if you've ever wondered why so many things in Judaism are also in Islam, that's the reason why. For example, um, a few things that he borrowed were being kosher. Jews don't eat pork, Muslims don't eat pork. Uh, Jews pray a few times a day, Muslims pray a few times a day. Jews fast on the holiday of Yom Kippur, Muslims fast on Ramadan. Only they don't fast for one day, they fast for an entire month. So Muhammad, armed with these new traditions, goes next door to preach to the Jews. And the Jews were so hospitable, and they welcomed him. And he started to preach to them, and he tried to recruit them. They were so hospitable, they actually changed the name of their town from Yertut to Medina, meaning Nebi, or the city of the prophet. They actually changed the name for him. And he said, you need to follow me and my religion. And they said, no, we're happy with our religion. We want to stay Jewish. We don't accept you as the last prophet. And that is when he turned into a military warrior and turned against them. This is all fact out of their own books, the Hadith and the scriptures. This is where it comes from. Muhammad was a warrior. Muhammad started to persecute the Jews and kicked them out of Medina and took over their city. Then after conquering Medina, he went back to his own city of Mecca and he took over Mecca. And from there, Islam started to spread throughout Arabia. He and his men started conquering other tribes and areas in the Middle East. The Jews and Christians became dimmi. And dimmi in Arabic is a second class. So we became second class citizens. As he took over areas, he took money and belongings of the Jews and the Christians. They killed their men and enslaved their women and children. Muslims were the first people to enslave other human beings. I don't care what you hear about when it comes to African Americans coming here on slave ships, Read your history and look who owned those slave ships. Who went into Africa and actually captured them? You'll find they were Muslims. They were the first ones to do it, and they still today are doing it. And the largest slave trade throughout the world is run by Islam. Again, not my opinion. Please feel free to check it out. Well, what he did after enslaving the women and children, the only way the Jews and the Christians were allowed to stay alive was by paying the jizya, or protection tax. The Jews and Christians were no longer allowed to build temples or churches. The Jews were not allowed to blow their chauffeur or pray publicly. The Christians were not allowed to ring their church bells or pray publicly. This spread all over Arabia. Muslims went and conquered Jerusalem and Islam spread and the more it spread, then they came up with this special assignment for the Jewish people. Now, a lot of people think that the Yellow Star of David was started by Hitler. It was not. It was actually, it was an idea that Hitler took from the Muslims. The Yellow Star of David was invented in the 9th century by the Caliphate leader, Cal Caliph al-Mutawaki, the second Caliph of Iraq. He invented the Yellow Star that Jews could be identified as they walked down the street. And Hitler copied that a thousand years later and put it in and implemented it during World War II. That was not a Nazi invention, it was an Islamic invention. This is how big they got. This, it's 
amazing. So the Jews and the Christians in Jerusalem were not allowed to pray publicly or fix their temples or churches. That is when the Pope, Pope Urban II, in 1095, said to the Christians in Europe, how can you with good conscience sit here and pray knowing what is happening to your brethren in the Holy Land? And that, my friends, is what launched the Crusaders in 1095. The Crusaders were not just a bunch of, and forgive me anyone here that's Jewish because you're going to hate when I say this, the, the Crusaders were not a bunch of crazy Christians going out to try and convince people to convert to Christianity. The Crusaders were launched to reconquer Jerusalem that had been conquered by the Muslims and to free the Christians and Jews that were being tortured and subjugated under Islam. The Crusaders were able to liberate Jerusalem for less than 100 years before Saladin was able to take it back into Islam and then Islam continued to spread. And let me find my spot here, my apologies. I did not memorize this, I just threw this together and it's Dee's fault. <laughs> Dee asked me to write this. Well, the Crusaders tried to fight Islam and liberate Christian land for 300 years. And by the 1300s, the Crusaders gave up and disappeared because they could not defeat the Islamic Empire and the Islamic army. Islam continued to grow and prosper. Now get this, folks. By the 1600s, Islam covered more of the Earth's surface than the Roman Empire did at its peak. Okay, a lot of people don't realize that. How big it got. And this is how Islam spread. They went all the way out of Arabia. They went into central China. They went into India and Spain. They conquered all of Spain and went into parts of Europe. And as they conquered different areas, they would change the name. Spain became Andalusia. Jerusalem became Al Quds. And as they conquered different people and minorities, they forced them to speak the Arabic language. Because the easiest way to strip a culture from its heritage is change their language. And many people don't realize this, and this is very important. There are about 8 million Arabs in the United States. 80% of those Arabic-speaking people in the United States are Christians that fled their own country because of Islamic persecution. They're not Muslim. That's the language they know because that's the language they were forced to use. And that's why you have Arabic throughout many of these countries. <coughs> Islam did not grow throughout the nations and cover most of the earth's surface because they were tolerant of other societies. They conquered and subjugated other societies, and the way Islam grew and prospered was to force people to pay the jizya, the protection tax, so as they conquered Christian lands, the Islamic empire became richer and richer from all the money that was being paid to them by the people they conquered. Only the Jews and the Christians were allowed to stay alive if they didn't convert because they were people of the book. The Buddhists, the Hindus, anything else. If you didn't convert, you would die. I need a drink. So if somebody sees the uh, waitress, let her know I need a drink. The Industrial Revolution is what gave the Europeans the power that the Crusaders did not have in order to defeat Islam. By the 1800s, the Europeans were already driving the Muslims out of different parts of the world. And by the 20th century, the Muslims were confined in Northern Africa and the Middle East. So the Turkish Empire, which was also known as the Ottoman Empire, ended in 1924. Somebody's ringing. <laughs> now I want to backtrack here for one second. Because this is real important. Another interesting thing happened in the late 1700s, early 1800s. There was this new country in 1786 called the United States. And the United States found that it was having to deal very directly with the tenets of the Muslim religion. The Barbary states of North Africa, which were the North African, thank you, the North African provinces of the Ottoman Empire plus Morocco. Pardon me. We're using the ports of today's Algeria, Libya, and Tunisia to wage a war of piracy and enslavement 
against any and all ships that passed through the Strait of Gibraltar. Thousands of vessels were taken over and over a million Europeans and Americans were sold into slavery during the 200 year reign of the Muslim Barbary Coast rulers. In addition, these pirates randomly raided towns on the coast of Europe and captured people, bringing them back to North Africa to ransom or sell into slavery. They even came so far as the shores of America to capture settlers and bring them back to Africa to ransom or sell. A lot of people don't know that part of history. They especially prized young women and children who could be used as concubines or made into eunuchs. Many European countries wanted this to stop, of course. To which the leaders of the North African countries replied, all you have to do is pay us a certain amount of money every year and we'll stop attacking ships from your country. Many of the European countries paid the tribute because it was cheaper than going to war. Of course, that was a short-term self-defeating solution because paying the tribute made the North African Muslim countries more powerful and more capable of terror, plunder, and mayhem. Agreements were actually reached between the United States and the rulers of the Barbary Coast. In exchange for cash payments, the rulers pledged to guarantee the safe passage of American ships and to put a stop to the practice of the maritime kidnapping. As the 18th century came to a close, Americans were cautiously optimistic that they had solved the Barbary problem. By 1801, it became clear that the policy of appeasement had failed. The Pasha of Tripoli, who, for, who five years earlier had been satisfied with $56,000 a year, now was demanding larger sums. When they were not forthcoming, piracy resumed. The Algerians received payments from the United States totaling $990,000 plus another $585,000 in the year 1793 to cover the ransom of 11 American ships. To say the least, this bothered Jefferson. These were extraordinary sums of money for a nation that at that time, our budget, get this folks, was $7 million a year. <laughs> And we have just paid 990,000 plus another 585,000 just to Algeria alone. Well, it bothered Jefferson. Now, it just so happened that while Jefferson was the ambassador in France, he met with John Adams, who was the ambassador from Britain. And together, the two men sat down with the ambassador from Tripoli. And he was, Tripoli, remember, was one of those North African Muslim pirate countries. Jefferson and Adams asked him why Tripoli was attacking ships. Why attack the United States? They had no previous interactions. Why the hostility? Why did they choose America as an enemy? And the Tripoli Muslim ambassador was very straightforward. He said basically, that's what we do. We're commanded to do so by a law. <laughs> You don't need to take my word for it because Jefferson actually wrote about this. And he wrote later that the Tripoli ambassador told him, quote, it was written in their Quran that all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet Muhammad were sinners. And it was the right and duty of the faithful, the Muslims, to plunder and enslave. And that every Muslim who was slain in warfare was sure to go to paradise, end quote. Where does that sound familiar? If you die in the way of a holy war, jihad, you're going to go to paradise. This was in the 1700s, 1800s. This is what we still hear today. Jefferson couldn't believe this. And he decided to look into the matter further. So he did the one thing that every single person should do. He read the Quran. He read the entire Quran. And he learned what Islam was all about. And that way, oops, wrong way, to that. Now, anybody, I know we've got some veterans in here. If you're a Marine, don't say anything. <laughs> if you're a former Marine, 
you're not allowed to say anything. Does anybody besides the Marines know the history of why the Marines are called Leathernecks or what that is? Besides D, I know you know it. Who lives with me? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you. The Marines are called Leathernecks because they actually were this. I want you to think about the first sentence in the Marine Corps hymn. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Does anybody here know, besides the Marines, why Tripoli is mentioned in the Marine Corps hymn? Earlier this year, President Obama, and, and let me say this, especially because I know we've got both Democrats and Republicans here. What I am saying tonight is not a Republican-Democrat issue. It is not a conservative liberal issue. It is a national security issue. And on 9 11, everybody that died, we all played the same color. And I don't care what you are. I don't care if you're a communist, a Bernie socialist. I don't care what you put yourself into. This should not become a partisan issue. And somehow over the years, it has become that way. So I'm going to pick on Obama for a second. Forgive me if you're a Democrat or you like Obama. <coughs> Earlier this year, President Obama said, quote, Here in America, Islam has been woven into the fabric of our country since its founding. The only place that I know that Islam was woven into the fabric of this country was woven into these. The Marines wore these in the battle battle with the Barbary Coast pirates. So their heads wouldn't get chopped off. That's where that comes from. That is a, a leather stock that you wear around the neck. We outfitted our Marines with these. There was a reason behind it. And that's why I asked Marines not to say anything. In 1801, <clears throat> I told you I was going to lose my voice. In 1801, the first Barbary War began when Thomas Jefferson became president and ordered the U.S. Navy vessels to the Mediterranean Sea in protest of the continuing U.S. raids on ships from the Barbary states of Morocco, Algeria, Tunis, and Tripoli. After two years of minor confrontations, sustained action actually began in June 1803 when a small expeditionary force attacked the Tripoli Harbor in what is today present-day Libya. The phrase to the shores of Tripoli from the official U.S. Marine Corps song has its roots in what is called the Derma Campaign. In 1805, a major American victory came during the Derma Campaign, which was undertaken by U.S. land forces and U.S. Marines in North Africa. This brought an end to the Barbary Coast Pirates, and it was the first foreign war ever fought by the United States. And interestingly enough, when we used force, the Islamic countries remained contained and weakened for almost a century. Because force is all they understand. I'm not a warmonger. Believe me, I'm not. I've seen it. I've been there, done that, have the t-shirt, as they say. And any one of us who's a battle here knows it's not what you see in the movies. And I haven't had a good night's sleep since I was 18 years old because of it. Nobody wants to see war. But what I don't want is to see my daughter or my grandchildren on their knees one day with somebody standing over them, giving them the choice of convert or die. And I know what I'm going to tell my daughter when she says, Daddy, where were you when all this was going on? I tried to stop it by educating. That's, that's my own little rant, my own reason that I do this. So as I said earlier, the Turkish Empire, which was known as the Ottoman Empire, or the Caliphate, ended in 1924. That is less than 100 years ago. Most people think World War II is ancient history. Especially the kids today. The Ottomans entered into World War I. Their entry into the Middle Eastern theater ended with the partition of the Ottoman Empire. That area of that map was all split up after World War I. And
and the Ottoman Empire came to an end, the Allies and the Turks met in Louisiana and Switzerland, and they came up with the Treaty of Servais, or Servais, if I'm pronouncing it wrong. The resulting treaty secured international recognition for the new Turkish state and its borders. The treaty was signed on July 24, 1923, and Turkey ratified it on August 23, 1923, and Turkey's first president, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, pushed for a more modern Islam. That's why Turkey is one of the most, or at least used to be, modern Arab countries, because their first president, Ataturk, pushed for a more modern Islam. And on March 3rd, 1924, he officially abolished, get this, the caliphate. The Ottoman Empire was abolished. But what's more is on April, April 8th, 1924, all of the Sharia, Islamic courts, were abolished in Turkey. He was not well liked. After President Ataturk ended the Ottoman Empire, only five years later, a group of Muslims in Egypt were feeling so humiliated. How could the Christians and the Jews liberate themselves from Islam? After all, Islam is superior to all other religions. Muslims are superior to all other people. And they founded the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928 to try and bring back the Islamic Empire. This is what started what some people refer to as radical Islam, what I call devout Islam. This is the Muslim Brotherhood logo. Um, you guys that have seen uh, John Bondola's <laughs> presentation, I think, did he do a PowerPoint? I think he showed this. This is, their, this is their logo, the Muslim Brotherhood. It's the Quran with two swords and two words in Arabic. The two words are, make ready. And it comes from the Quranic verse that we've already read. Make ready for them, whatever you can, of force and horses of war, for which to terrorize Allah and his enemies. Make ready. The Muslim Brotherhood motto. Allah is our objective. The Prophet is our leader. The Quran is our law. Jihad is our way. Dying in the way of Allah is our highest hope. Allah Akbar. That is the motto of the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, just real quick, the swords reinforce the group's military background as traditional weapons. The, uh, the Quran reinforces the uh, spiritual foundation, and the two Quran words are the group's uh, commitment to jihad. That's the breakdown of their logo. You know, they have their own website, English. You can go to their website. Like everybody else today, they've got a website. It was not random. It was not random Muslims coming to the United States that started the Muslim Brotherhood. Let me repeat that since I didn't read it correctly. It wasn't random Muslims that came to America that started the Muslim Brotherhood. We know this from documents, audio, and evidence in court. It was the MSA that was set up as a structure for the Muslim Brotherhood to come into the United States and lay the groundwork. Long before you had many Muslim immigrants coming here. The MSA is the Muslim Student Association. It was brought to the United States 1961-62. Little argument as to when they actually were established. These are your local MSA groups here in the Triangle. The MSA group at Duke, NC State, UNC. To put this into perspective, this is where, you know, Muslims, I say this all the time, Muslims are a lot of things, but one of them is not stupid. And they knew, if you want to take over an area, if you really want to instill Sharia, if you want to change the way America thinks and acts, start with the kids. And that's what they did. It was brilliant. Just like the term radical and modern. 
It's all marketing. They're, they're not stupid. <clears throat> now, there are a lot of Muslim Brotherhood groups in the United States. This is just a few. Care, we could have mentioned all of them. The Council on American Islamic Relations. ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. These are all legal groups that are all part of the Muslim Brotherhood. This is not a secret. We know. You can go to their, they're nonprofit organizations. Go and read, go to their websites. They're part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Legal organizations here in the United States that are working all for the same goal. Now, ISNA, according to documents obtained by the FBI, is the largest Muslim Brotherhood group and the nucleus for Islamic movement here in the United States. In July 2007, seven key leaders of an Islamic charity known as the Holy Land Foundation for Relief and Development went on trial. It was the nation's largest terrorism trial in history. 2007, you can look up Holy Land Foundation uh, trial and you'll get all the information you want on it. Well, these seven key leaders went on trial for charges that they had provided material support and resources to a foreign terrorist organization, which turned out to be Hamas, um, engaged in money laundering, breached the International Emergency Economics Power Act, which prohibits transactions that threaten American national security. Along with the seven defendants, the U.S. government released a list of over 300 other unindicted co-conspirators during the course of the Holy Land Foundation trial, many incriminating documents were entered into evidence. Perhaps the most, the most uh, significant of these was the explanatory memorandum on the general strategic goal for the group in North America. And this was by the Muslim Brotherhood operative, Muhammad Akram. Federal investigators found Akram's memo in the home of a man named Ismail al barisi the founder of the Dar al-Hijra Mosque in Falls Church, Virginia, during a 2004 search of his home. They didn't find it in his basement. They didn't find it in the hidden sub-basement. They found it in the sub-sub-basement. And John Mongolo was part of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. We had the pleasure of, of hearing a presentation by a gentleman that was part of that whole group of the FBI. So they found this in the sub-sub-basement. al Raisi was a member of the Palestine Committee, which the Muslim Brotherhood had created to support Hamas in the United States. Now you need to understand that the word shura in Arabic is like a parliament. Memorandum. This is the memorandum on the general goal for the Muslim Brotherhood in North America. It's the long-term plan that was approved and adopted by the Muslim Brotherhood Parliament in 1987. It had been kept secret all those years. The Iqwan, which is Arabic for Brotherhood, must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. That comes right out of here and the Hadith. You know, in Christianity, and if I'm wrong, somebody correct me, I know we have a of pastors over there. In Christianity, there's this thing called witnessing. And it's okay to do that. You want to go and talk to somebody and tell them about Jesus, tell them about your faith, and hopefully persuade them to come into your faith, take Jesus into the heart, right? That's witnessing. In, our, in, in, in Islam, it's a little bit different. They don't do it that way. They don't come to you and talk nicely about it. And nowhere in Christianity or Judaism does it say the only religion that should dominate the world and kill anybody else who doesn't want to submit to that. Because let's not forget, 
Islam means submission. There's your founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, Hassan al-Banna. His own words, not mine. It is the nature of Islam to be dominant, not to be dominated. To impose its law on all nations and extend its power to the entire planet. There's your Muslim Brotherhood. That is what they're doing. And make no mistake, folks, they're doing a good job of it. Watch the media today. And when we take questions, I'll be able probably, I'm sure someone will ask me about that, we'll be able to answer that. Now, Saeed Qutub wrote a book called Milestones. The Muslim Brotherhood refers to it as the Jihadi Field Manual of the Muslim Brotherhood. Who is Saeed Qutub? He was an Egyptian author, an educator, a poet, and a leading member of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood in the 1950s and 60s. But from 1948 to 1950, he came here to the United States on a scholarship to study our educational system. And he spent several months at Colorado State College of Education, which is now known as the University of Northern Colorado. He never looked better. That is Saeed Kutu behind bars before he got assassinated. He was convicted in 1966 of plotting the assassination of then Egyptian president Gamal Abdel Nasser, and he was executed by hanging. His words, the movement of Islam, which is then to be carried throughout the earth to the whole of mankind, as the object of this religion is all humanity and its sphere of action, the whole earth. Over and over and over again from all the Islamic scholars, from imams, from the leaders, from the Muslim Brotherhood to the lowest individual in a mosque, this is what they teach. Let me explain. The Muslims that flew planes into the World Trade Center on 9-11 were being good Muslims. They were doing what their book told them to do. They weren't radical. They were devout. And I know there's probably people sitting here saying, but if, if they were devout, how did they go to a bar and drink? And we're going to cover that. We're going to cover that too. We're going to cover that too. I know you guys are I appreciate it. Here's the reason that they hate us. Part of the reason that they hate us, I should say. A city upon the hill is a phrase from the parable of salt and wood in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5.14, he tells his listeners, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Shiny city on the hill. This has become popular with American politicians. But it says something. It says something to those who believe in Allah. It says something to the Muslims. We are Athens, Rome, and Jerusalem. America, exceptionalism has made us the new chosen people. We're everything that they don't want people to stand for. We're everything that they don't believe. Immigrants, settlers, flood oppression, seeking equal opportunity and tolerance, none of which is in the Islamic law. All men created equal, not under Islamic law. Our rights are inalienable, and there's a separation of faith and state, not under Islamic law. These are all the things that they are striving to get rid of. <coughs> the reliance of the traveler, this is very important. You need to understand that the word jihad has everybody here heard the term jihad? When I came to America in 1981, nobody knew what that meant. I interviewed with the FBI in 1981. I had just come back from Israel. And do, do you guys remember back in the 80s when on our resumes we used to put a short-term objective and a long-term objective? Maybe they still do that. I don't know. I haven't filled out a resume in a while. My short-term objective was to secure a position with a law enforcement agency. My long-term objective was to specialize in anti-terrorism. Sat across the table from an FBI agent, 
So I'm going to go on my interview. I was so excited. And he looked at my resume and he read it out loud to me. <laughs> this is America. We don't have terrorism. He laughed. He laughed at me. This is America. We don't have terrorism. 1981. I said, sir, wait 10 years and remember the word jihad. And he did like my German shepherd. <laughs> he looked at me like I just grew a third head or something. I had no idea what I was talking about. <clears throat> Jihad. Recently, John Brennan said it's an inner struggle. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> and I'm going to prove it by their words. 100% God bless you, Taylor. 100% of everything written on Jihad in Islamic, from Islamic scholars, Islamic books, Islamic texts, 100%. Jihad is a holy war against the unbelievers, period. It's got nothing to do with an inner struggle. But that's what they want you to believe. The Reliance of the Traveler, the classic manual of Islamic sacred law. It was composed in the 14th century. It is a one volume, and I just noticed, I didn't put space in there, my apologies. It is a one volume authoritative summation of Islamic law from one of its major schools of jurisprudence. And despite its age, it is the single most popular handbook of Islamic law in the United States and a leading authority throughout the world. What is this book? Why is it so important? The Reliance is the first Islamic legal work in European language, outside of Arabic, to receive certification from the most important seat of the Sunni Islamic jurisprudence, Cairo's Al-Azhar University. In addition, in the opening pages, it contains an endorsement from the leading Muslim Brotherhood think tank here in the United States, the International Institute of Islamic Thought. And they say that every Muslim in America should have this book in their home. Well, what's this book? <coughs> if you're a Muslim and you're living in an Islamic country, you live under Islamic law, Sharia. You don't have any problems. You don't have to worry about, am I doing things legally? Because you know what the rules are. You live under Sharia. So you live by Sharia. You live by the law. But if you are living outside of a Muslim country, under the laws of another country, that's where this book comes in. It's kind of like a guideline as to the do's and don'ts. What you can and cannot do as a Muslim if you're living outside of a Muslim country. In the section of Jihad, and notice I'm going to notate in here all the different parts you can find this. You can actually pull this book up online. I got a stretch. On their section of Jihad, Jihad means to wage war against non-Muslims. It comes from the word mujahada, signifying warfare to establish the religion. It's a warfare to establish Islam. That's what the word comes from, the word jihad. You heard of muhajideen. Same thing, that's where it comes from. The entry on jihad in the Book of Reliance even gets more explicit. <coughs> and, it, and it explains and outlines the scriptural basis for jihad in three definitive verses from Muhammad in the Quran. Fighting is prescribed for you. Slay them wherever you find them. Fight the idolaters utterly. As these commands are in the Quran itself, Muslims believe they originated with Allah, and as such, they are obligated to follow the book. They are obligated to wage war. Reliance then goes in to referencing the justifications for jihad warfare in the two most authoritative hadith collections. And the hadith, the life and times of Muhammad that I spoke about, there's two books that are very authoritative. One is by Bukhari, the other by a man named Muslim. And they relate to Muhammad himself where he said, this is Muhammad's words, I have been commanded to fight people until they testify that there is no God but Allah. And that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and perform the prayer and pay zakat. And if they say it, they've saved their blood and possessions 
from me, except, and I love this part, for the rights of Islam over them. And then, of course, their final reckoning is with Allah when they die. Let's break that down. It's real simple. He's been commanded to fight. Commanded to fight until you admit, swear, testify that there is no other God but Allah. Commanded to fight those people until they testify. And that Muhammad is the messenger from Allah. And you have to perform the Islamic prayers. And you have to pay zakat. Don't confuse zakat with jizya. Jizya is a protection tax. Zakat is a charity. They'll call it charity. But it's interesting because if you look up zakat, and they actually have a shura council that disperses zakat, every Muslim is required by Islamic law to pay a certain amount of his pay to zakat every year. The percentage varies on the individual. Part of that has to go towards jihad. So these companies that say they are Sharia compliant, has anybody ever heard of Sharia compliant companies here in the United States? HSB, credit cards, Visa, MasterCard, they're Sharia compliant. These companies have become Sharia compliant. Look them up online. Uh, USB, some of your biggest financial companies. Why is that? Because they knew that devout Muslims would not do business with them unless they were Sharia compliant. So what these companies do, American and other companies from Europe, actually take a piece of their profits every year and give it to the, this Zakat Shura Council, this parliament of people, which is five people that are Muslim scholars, and they distribute that money for Muslim charity. Except part of it goes for weapons, for the jihad. It's actually written in the Hadith, in the Quran, and in the reliance of the traveler as to the percentage that actually has to be given to jihad. Yes, ma'am. They have to pay the cop. They don't have to, they chose to. They chose to. But and part I, of that money goes for jihad. jihad. Yes. I wrote an article, and everybody remind me before we leave, and I'll tell you where to find it on my website. I wrote an article um, with an expert from Wall Street. She, she knew nothing about Islam, and I knew nothing about Wall Street. We got together. Uh, Joy Brighton was her name. She writes articles on finance. We wrote an article called, Are We Financing Our Own Demise? About all the money that has been given to jihad over the years through American corporations. This is why there was a lawsuit. Uh, there have been companies that have been brought to court. They're still in court. They've gone all the way to the Supreme Court. If you don't know it, on 9-11. American companies have been brought to court by people that lost loved ones on 9-11 because they sued them that they gave money to help pay for 9-11. American corporations. So throughout, throughout the 80s, they blew up our embassies, our consulates, our barracks, and attacked our interests. In the 1990s, we see it escalate as the movement moves deeper into Europe and the United States and Canada and elsewhere. Then there was 9-11. And from 9-11 until now, our leadership on both sides of the aisle tell us this has nothing to do with Islam. The entire purpose of Islam, according to all Islamic doctrine, is to ensure that there is an Islamic state throughout the entire world called the Caliphate, where Sharia is the law of the land. It's that simple. Ask any Muslim you meet about the world being divided into two parts. Every Muslim knows this. There's Dalai Islam and Dalai Ha. And what is that? It's the house of Islam and the house of war. That's it. There's two parts. If you're living under Sharia rule, you're under Dar al Islam. You're in the house of Islam. If you're not living under Islamic rule, you're in the house of war. Their words, not mine. Their preaching, not my opinion. It is that simple. And that's all we need to know. 100% of published Islamic law 
is defined as warfare against non-Muslims. According to the reliance of the traveler, the act of weaving Islam is known as apostasy or riddah, the ugliest form of unbelief. You've ever heard the term kufar? We're all kufars, we're unbelievers. When a person who has reached puberty, this is a quote from page 595. When a person who has reached puberty and is sane voluntarily apostatizes from Islam, he deserves to be killed, end quote. Repentance is accepted so that he is not killed, but if he refuses to repent, then the calf or his representative may execute him without indemnity or expectation of killing him. This is why we have seen honor killings in the United States, and if you don't think they're happening, believe me, I've interviewed people who have done it, I've interviewed people who have had relatives that have been died, I've written about honor killings more than I care to remember. It happens on a regular basis in the United States. But our media wouldn't have you believe that. They're downplaying it. The words of our enemies. That's uh, Ayman al-Zwahiri. used to be the second in command of Al-Qaeda until Osama bin Laden got taken out. Now he's in charge. <coughs> Real interesting that he made this statement on the 19th of November, 2008. Anybody know what date that was? What that? What happened on that day? Elections. Exactly. You must also appreciate. You also must appreciate as you take over the presidency of America during its crusade against Islam and Muslims that you are neither facing individuals nor organizations, but facing a jihadi awakening and a renaissance which is shaking the pillars of the entire Muslim world. And this is the fact which you and your government and country refuse to recognize and pretend not to see. He said that the day that Obama won the election. Why? Why are all these different Islamic groups saying these things, committing terrorism, Irgul, their word, but yet our leaders are saying, oh, you no, know, it's got nothing to do with this song. It's because they don't have jobs. It's climate change. Yeah, that, that's actually Marie Hart, State Department spokesperson. Global warming creates terrorism. Wow. We must have had global warming 1,400 years ago, so that's about how long it's been going on. Just in, in Islam itself. Unemployment creates terrorism. So, the psychiatrist, Dr. Major Nadal Hassan, was poor. No, no, no. The guy from San Bernardino who worked for the county health department was poor. No. <laughs> Where are these poor? Uh, Osama bin Laden, he must have been poor. Osama bin Laden was a multi-millionaire. Did you guys know that? His father owns a construction company in Saudi Arabia, which basically built that country, one of the wealthiest men in the world. But they're trying to tell us that terrorism is because of people being poor. We have doctors and lawyers and engineers joining this jihadi struggle. It has nothing to do with anything except the fact that their book tells them that is what is to be done. Now, I'm sure there's many people in here who have met Muslims in the United States, oh, they're great people. They're friends of mine. I have no problem with that. I work with a Muslim. Anybody ever heard the term taqiyya? If a Muslim cannot achieve a permissible goal, such as promoting Islam in the eyes of non-Muslims, or preventing its denigration in the eyes of non-Muslims, by telling the truth, then he is actually obliged not just permitted, but commanded to lie in order to achieve that goal. Lying is permitted for Muslims in war, settling disagreements, and I love this one, a man talking with his wife. <laughs> I think Muhammad threw that in there because they're allowed to have up to four, and God knows if you've got four of them, you better be a good liar. <laughs> Tell 
takia, dissimulation, deceit to benefit Islam or an individual Muslim against an infidel. It's not mentioned once or twice, it's mentioned at least three times in the Holy Book. Now, read something interesting the other day, thank you, Dee. A psychologist over 20 years ago, might have been a psychiatrist, either way, psychologist, psychiatrist, over 20 years ago was doing a study on different things that happen when an individual lies. Their body language, their eye movements, the way they sweat, the way they breathe, the way they speak, the way they stutter. And he found that when Muslims lie, unlike any other group of people, they didn't do that. So he studied as to why it was. Do you remember reading this thing? Because they are commanded by Allah that it's okay. So they have absolutely no emotional empathy or moral anything to say what they're doing is wrong. So therefore, when they lie, you don't see the body language that you would normally be able to see in a regular individual when they're lying. Because they know it's okay. They're allowed to lie. Allah told them so. They are commanded to lie. In Islam, there are other forms besides taqiyya, which is the most commonly quoted use of the word. There is, and taqiyya is deceit for the purpose of spreading Islam. There is tawiyya, deceit by ambiguity, kitman, deceit by omission, maruna, deceit by the temporary suspension of sharia, tasir, deceit through facilitation, and dawara, deceit through necessity. Did I have dawara in there twice? I think I might have. Now, let's talk about very quickly, I ran and I swear we're almost done. <laughs> it's a lot to cover, we're doing 1,400 years in an hour or more. The beginning of the rise. In 1979, Iran calls for the destruction of the U.S. Its constitution, Iran's constitution, says their entire purpose is to wage jihad so that Islam will dominate the earth. This is translated from the actual constitution of Iran. In the formation and equipping of the country's defense forces, due attention must be paid to faith and ideology as the basic criteria. Accordingly, the Army of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps are to be organized in conformity with this goal, and they will be responsible not only for guarding and preserving the frontiers of the country, but also for fulfilling the ideological mission of jihading God's way, that is extending the sovereignty of Allah's law throughout the world. Again, this is in accordance with the Quran section that we keep reading. Prepare against them whatever you are able of power and of steeds of war, by which you may terrorize the enemy of Allah and your enemy. We have an issue where, and that, that, don't even worry about that just yet. I just threw that into the head. We have an issue in the United States where our government has been infiltrated at the highest levels with known and admitted Muslim Brotherhood operatives. If you wonder why we're seeing a lot of the things we're seeing in the United States, all you have to do is look at the Department of Homeland Security, the CIA, the FBI, the White House, uh, Clinton. Let's talk about Hillary Clinton's aide, Huma Abedin. Her father is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Her mother is actually a member of the Muslim Sisterhood. Now, although there's no known connection that admittedly that Huma is a member, she has a lot of co-worker, not co-workers, um, colleagues from other countries that are members that she deals with on a regular basis. We have got, at the highest levels of the Department of Homeland Security, Muslim Brotherhood members. Again, I'm not going to have time to go over it all. I've done this in other lectures and speeches where I name them all and their position. They go all the way up to the White House. Oh, yeah. Valerie Jarrett, Dolly Mulcahy. Anybody know who Dolly Mulcahy is? She's the first person in the history of the United States who actually goes to work every day in the White House and she wears a hijab. She's one of Obama's top advisors. Dalia Mogan, look her up. Where is 
for courage. What a surprise. This is something that just got leaked. And, and I thought it was so funny because I've been screaming for years when I started writing articles about how journalists are no longer journalists. That's true. They don't report the news anymore. They tell you what they want you to hear. And I don't know if you guys can read that, but I have underlined here. This is from the Society of Professional Journalists. Subline. Improving and protecting journalism since 1909. This is a memo that got leaked out and I got a hold of it today. When writing about terrorism, remember to include white supremacists, radical anti-abortionists, and other groups with a history of such activity. Do not imply that kneeling on the floor praying, listening to Arabic music, or reciting from the Quran are peculiar activities. This is a memo for journalists telling us how to write things and what not to do? Next line in red. Avoid using word combinations such as Islamic terrorist or Muslim extremist that are misleading because they link the whole religion to criminal activity. Do not use religious characterizations as shorthand when geographic, political, socioeconomic, or other distinctions might be more accurate. Are you raising your hand? No, she's second question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ask men and women from within the targeted communities to review your coverage and make suggestions. Oh yeah, that's what I do when I write my articles. I'm going to go and I'm going to I'm going to walk up to a, a development <coughs> in Newport, Michigan, and I'm going to say, Hey, before I publish this article about terrorism, would you mind telling me what's wrong with it? Because I know that you're not going to lie to me, <laughs> even though it's in here. Our media is lying to us. Somewhere under the Bush administration, okay, I'm not picking on the Democrats, George Bush stood up on 9-13, two days after 9-11, and had standing behind him over his shoulder a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, and he said, Islam is a religion of peace. Now I understand why he did that, I don't think he should have. But at the time, if you recall, after 9-11, we had a man that was a Sikh. Totally different religion. The Sikhs and the Muslims hate each other more than the Jews and the Muslims do. They've been fighting for thousands of years. Well, over a thousand years. We had a Sikh driving down a highway in California, had his turban on, was shot in the head and killed after 9-11. For no other reason than some schmuck thought he was a Muslim because he had a, a towel on his head, as it was quoted. So what we started to see in the United States, Bush had to calm those fears. He had to calm that down. And he got up and said, it's a religion of peace. And boy, the Council on American Islamic Relations took that and ran. That's where this all started. Think about it. Think pre-9-11. If I had stood here on September 10th and told you Islamic terrorists are going to attack our country tomorrow and they're going to bring down the World Trade Center and they're going to hit the Pentagon. You would have had me taken out of here and put in a rubber room. But if I had stood here on 9-12 and said, you know, within 10 years, God bless you, Muslims in the United States are going to be looked at as the victims. We're not going to be flying American flags anymore like we used to. Everybody remember, for a month after 9-11, you couldn't even buy a flag. They were on every car, every house, every store. Think about it now, because I see them being burned, stamped on, and when somebody, a veteran, gets up and tries to stop someone from doing that, they're the ones that are arrested. This is what we have become, and this is why it's so important that we educate. I don't have a problem with Muslims. I have a problem with Islam. I will not submit. Lan Ali Salam. Nancy, you've seen that on my email, at the bottom of every one of my emails. I refuse to submit. I understand this 
on because I grew up in Israel. And I had the... I don't even know what word to use. The experience of going to school with Muslims, working with Muslims, and fighting against Muslims. I understand their religion, but the thing that people don't comprehend, and this is the biggest problem we have in the United States, we all grew up with morals, and with ethics, and with Christian Judeo values, where we're like, there is no way that a religion could possibly be telling you to do that. There is no way another human being could, could he's got to be crazy. This isn't Islam, this is a religion. I mean, look, they've got a book that looks just like our Bible. Stop looking at it through Western eyes. I had the advantage of not being in this country and learning about it. I wasn't looking at it through Western eyes because I left here when I was a kid and I was able to understand this for what it is. Instead of trying to wrap my mind around no, that, that's not possible. And then when I hear on the news, the reporter's telling me it's a religion of peace. And that ISIS isn't really Islamic, and Al-Qaeda isn't really Islamic. And we're not at war with terrorism, we're at war with Al-Qaeda. But we're not at war with terrorism. Think of where we would be as a nation today if in World War II, we didn't say that we were at war with the Nazis. Think of the political correctness and where we would be today Think about how the term Japs was thrown around. You don't hear that anymore today. There are friends and allies now because we bombed the living hell out of them. Helped them rebuild. Sometimes that happens in war. But if we were the way we are today in World War II, you would all be speaking German. You would all be speaking German and I wouldn't be here. Yeah, I forgot. I've got a group of messianics over here. These crazy, crazy <laughs> Jews over here. <laughs> we need to educate. When the big thing was happening with Jones, Pastor Jones and the Westboro Baptist Church and burning Qurans, I did a video where I held a lighter under this. <laughs> and I said, nah, I don't want you to burn it. I want you to read it. You'd be hard pressed to get somebody to read the Bible today and went along this thing. I've read this three times. I'm ashamed to say I actually do know this better than the Old Testament, which is my Bible. But I understand where they're coming from. You don't have to even buy one. I didn't buy this, by the way. This was given to me by an employee of mine who didn't know what I do. And, uh, one God, one planet. November 18, 2001. That's the inscription. Got it from Murad. I had no idea because people that I work with don't know I do this on the side. One God, one planet. A month or two months after 9 11, 2001. Trying to convert me. But you can go online and you can download the entire Quran. You can go online and just read it. You don't even need to download it. If you don't want to download things, and I understand that, especially something like the Quran, because you're not familiar with the different websites. Right now, and I'm going to get into politics for a very brief second, my apologies to those who are Hillary fans. Hillary wants to increase the amount of Syrian refugees that we are bringing into this country right now by 550%. I love this analogy. I got a bowl of M&M's here. One of them is poison. How many are you going to eat? <laughs> if one person comes into this country that is affiliated with ISIS, you are going to see what we see in Europe, in France, in Belgium. You're going to see what we saw in Orlando tenfold. Right now the FBI has Open cases, open cases in the United States, not a five, ten, or even a hundred people that they are actively following because of ties to ISIS. Anybody want to take a wild guess how many open is 
ISIS cases the FBI has right now? Over 1,000. And you want to bring more people in here without proper vetting? And I'm not jumping on the Trump wagon here, believe me, folks. It's common sense. We already know that individuals that have committed acts of terrorism throughout Germany and Belgium and France were refugees. You want to bring them here? This is what I've been screaming about since I got here in 1981. Real quick, very quickly, and I'm not going to read all this. This is an imam. He's actually in Australia. He's not some crazy Syrian or Iraqi or... No, he's Australian. And he wrote an article because he was getting a lot of slack from his own people because... Remember I said, Yerub, terrorist. He wrote an article. Is it a term of praise or a term of abuse? And he explains why, if you were called a terrorist, take it as a compliment. Because that's what we are. That's what our book tells us to be. And look at, look at what he chose in his own article. That same passage. Prepare and say, whatever you are able to power of seeds and war, by which you may terrorize the enemy of Allah and your enemy. Terrorize with an S, because he's Australian. <laughs> <laughs> This is a continuation of his. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I do want to read the very last part that he said. If I can uh, find it, there. It is because of the understanding of the term terrorism that I object. This is an imam in Australia. I object to calling Obama, Bush, Bashar, or any of the other tyrants as terrorists because it implies into our hearts. No! Rather, we are not afraid of them, but rather they are afraid of us as they should be. For we are the ones who obey the command of Allah to terrorize his enemies, and we will continue to do so until the last day. We are Iraqun, terrorists. We believe in the command to terrify the enemies of the Ummah, and we will follow the way of our Prophet, who is the greatest of all in terrorizing his enemies. That was written within the last year in Australia. You want to bring this here? You want to ignore this here? Please, once you read anything and get a grasp of it, the only request that I have of you is that you pass it on to someone else. This is a numbers game. Right now, I've educated all of you, hopefully giving you just a little bit of enough that you're going to want to go out and educate yourself more. But what I want you to do is go out and tell others. Because otherwise, we're bound to lose this numbers game. We're starting to see it. We have Sharia, no-go zones, here in the United States. If you don't believe me, Google the town Dearborn, Michigan. Google Islamabad, New York, where the cops won't even go. Our own FBI won't go. To compound, where those that have gone in and managed to come out, including Eric Stackelbeck, who's a friend of mine, an investigative reporter, who has video of them shooting at school buses with AK-47s for target practice. Why, in God's name, would they be shooting at a school bus, I wonder? an awfully big target. It's not like a bad aim. Why a school bus? It's coming here. When I came to America, I said all we had to do was look at Europe and look at England, and I warned people it was going to come here. Now they're worse off than we're, we are exactly where they were 10 years ago, 15 years ago. If we don't stop this, folks, this numbers game of educating people, and letting people know what's really in this book, we're doomed to lose. I can go back to Israel. I mean, all of you can join me. But if you don't want to move to Israel and you want to stay here in the US, 
I suggest that you start to do something to educate yourself about Islam, about the truth of Islam, and then educate others. That's all I ask. And I will open it up to questions. Because I know you guys have questions. Yes, Sir John. You know, the American left has, let's call it an affinity for Islam. Yeah, Some elements of the left have embraced it. Yes. It ain't caused very much. Yet, probably the foremost leaders of the left are Jewish Americans. Hmm. How do you marry those two things? What was the last part of that? How do you marry these two, you know, how do you find Jews that are leaders on the left supporting that kind of philosophy I, I that can't. embraces Islam? I, I don't know. And you're going to have to repeat the question. Uh, you're saying that the leaders of the left, and the left in general, the left being the Democrats or progressives or whatever term you want to use, tend to side with Islam. And what did you say? That most of their leaders are Jewish. Yeah. Historically, they've been. Yes. So you know, I do a whole presentation on why Jews are Democrats to begin with, because personally, I think any Jew that, that, that is, is in the Democratic Party needs to learn about his own history. But I cannot fault people that are on the left that have a kumbaya attitude. I can't fault them for having the attitude of, you know, if I just treat you right, you're going to treat me right. And that's why the Jews belong to that same ideology, that same mindset. Because of the Holocaust, because they treat me and I know. And I've talked to Jews, older Jews and rabbis, who have explained this to me. And their answer is always, oh, it's the Holocaust. We don't want that to happen again. We need to be nice. We need to accept everyone. Look what happened when the Jews were not accepted. Good Islam as an anti Correct. But they don't see that. They see them as fellow human beings. And if we just treat them nice, they're going to treat us nice. And when it goes crazy, when it goes haywire, and you see people getting their heads chopped off, then it's, well, that's not Islam. It can't be, because, you know, we hear it's the religion of peace. They tell us it's the religion of peace. So it's, it's got to be, you know, there's just some crazy fringe. Well, it's amazing because that crazy fringe always tends to be devout Islam. I don't care what country they're in. So, yeah, the left has that. They're going to be the, the last ones. And by the way, that's a good point. There's a very famous saying in Arabic that I want everyone to know. And I'll translate it rather than giving it to you in Arabic. There's a saying in Arabic that is a war cry. It's used as a war cry to this day. And it's not al Akbar. It's an entire sentence. First comes Saturday, then comes Sunday. Why is that a war cry? What they're saying is first we're going to kill the Jews, then we're going to kill the Christians. Look it up. Again, I don't want you to take anything of what I've explained tonight as being my opinion. This is after years of study. I, I, I know Islam inside and out. I understand the mindset. If you grew up in a country where that is all you knew, and you were told your whole life, this is right, and anyone that doesn't believe in it is wrong, and your God commands you to make them understand that this is right, that's the way you would be. It's no different. They happen to be born into this. Do you know that according to Islamic law, according to a Muslim, you can ask any Muslim you meet, we are all Muslims. Did you know that? You are born a Muslim according to Muslims. When you get older, you decide to stray. You're taken out of the religion. According to Muslims, Jesus was a Muslim. <coughs> Never meet a Muslim, ask him, he'll tell you. Jesus was a Muslim. Moses was a Muslim. It's news to me. News to Moses. That's what they believe. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Do you have another website besides 
besides Google that gives this type of information? Oh, absolutely. If you guys go to my website, down the left-hand side, I've turned it off already. Down the left-hand left -hand side of my website, it says friends of ours, and there's all these links from A to Z where you can find other websites of other individuals like myself, including some websites by Muslims. This is why I get so angry when people say to me, oh, you just hate Muslims. You grew up in Israel. You fought against them. You don't like them. Really? What about Noni Darwish? Does anybody here know who Noni Darwish is? Noni Darwish. Her father was one of the founders of Hamas. He was assassinated by the state of Israel. <coughs> Noni Darwish has a love for Israel greater than anyone I know. She came to the United States, she got out of Islam, had to leave Gaza to get out, and started looking into why Israel killed her father. Along the way, she found Christianity, she converted, and she is more outspoken about Israel than most Israelis I know. But she's a former Muslim who isn't just a former Muslim. Her father was one of the founders of the terrorist organization Hamas. Dee and I have had on our radio show numerous former Muslims who have left the religion and said, guys, you need to know what's going on. Because what you're being told is BS. Yeah. The son of Hamas, I've heard him speak at UNC. Is he the same as the son of Hamas, his father was obviously somebody different. The son of Hamas, and his name right now slips my mind, he, um, he was actually a spy for Israel. And while he lived in Gaza, and his father is one of the leaders of Hamas, and that's what they call him, the son of Hamas. The U.S. government actually tried to deport him. Did you know that? There was a big fight. And the Israel actually broke ranks, because Israel will never admit to any kind of anything. I mean, they, they always have no comment. <laughs> we're not going to say yes, we're not going to say no. They broke ranks, and they came to the United States the day, he didn't even know what was going to happen, the day of his hearing at immigration, Israel came forward and admitted what he was, which is very unusual, and said, if you send this man back to Gaza, he will die. What he's telling you is the truth. He worked for our government. So yeah, the son of Hamas is it's also, and, I, and if I'm not mistaken, he also converted to Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Just a matter of interest, how much does the Black Lives Matter have in the United Oh, boy. You know, Black Lives Matter, unfortunately, and I did a rant about this on the show recently, Black Lives Matter had a delegation of their leaders that went to Israel just a week and a half, two weeks ago. And when they went to Israel, they immediately crossed over to the West Bank to the Palestinian territories. And they marched and rioted with the Palestinians. And they put in their new platform, their new platform about how their struggle is not just for blacks, but for all oppressed people. And Israel is an apartheid state. And Israel has committed genocide. And Israel this, and Israel this, and Israel this. And this, unfortunately, is now part of the platform of Black Lives Matter. Um, somewhere along the line, people in this country of all color, be it, you want to call them black, you want to call them African American, you want to call them Hispanic, I don't care. People of all color, somewhere along the line, forgot that in the 1960s, when they were marching for their civil rights, it was white Jews that went shoulder to shoulder with them, died, many of them died, fighting with them. Rabbi Levine, good friend of mine who lives in Israel now, had this big, huge picture about the size of this on his living room wall of Martin Luther King in his speech. You know, I have a dream. And there he is, right behind Martin Luther King over his shoulder. Because he marched with him when he was a kid in rabbinic school. Somewhere along the line, they started believing the likes of Louis Farrakhan, who, by the way, even though he's black, he's also the founder of the Nation of Islam, which is the black Islamic group here in the United States. 
little bit different, a little bit more violent. That's the group that Cactus Clay, Muhammad Ali, was originally part of, and then eventually he left. He said, I'm not part of this anymore. Because it was even too violent for him. Think about that. So Black Lives Matter does have a tie with the Muslims for some reason. And they're, they're getting their foot in the door. They're, they're going, the Muslim Student Association and the Muslim Brotherhood are going to a lot of these events saying, we are the same as you. And they show up at these events and they, 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 they start to intermingle. And that's how they're growing here in the United States, they being the Muslim Brotherhood. So they do a lot of prison recruiting. There is more converts to Islam in U.S. prisons than anywhere else. Yes. There was a survey that was done not too long after 2000, or after 9/11, and they surveyed American Muslims, and I forget the exact figure, but it was something like 10 or 15 or something percent of American Muslims really didn't see a problem with the World Trade Center being taken down. But when, the, when you look at the details of the data, it showed that converts, black American Muslim converts, had a much higher percentage of feeling that there was no gain in activity. So they, were, they were more radicalized even than regular Muslims. It's unfortunate, and, and I've done shows, radio shows on this, people have done videos on it. One of them I might add is a Muslim woman. She's not a former Muslim, she's still Muslim. And she talks about, don't speak for me, remember that video? Oh, yeah, she's great. Where she was talking about how many actually believe that. Now she's not of that belief. There are Muslims out there who refer to themselves as being devout Muslims. This is where it gets a little weird. Dr. Zahudi Jasser, you may have seen him a lot on Fox News, he considers himself, he says that he is a devout Muslim. I've interviewed him on my radio show. Needless to say, he uh, wasn't too happy with me afterwards because I threw a lot of these facts at him. How am I to believe you when you know, if you're a devout Muslim, that you're going to follow this book and in this book it tells you to lie to me? He didn't like that too much. We're still friends, but we were friends before that interview. But he thought he was coming on to talk about something else, and I kind of jumped on him. Or you. I am very concerned about the corporations that are uh, Sharia compliant. Yeah, sure. Are, sure, should have pulled that up, and I'm gonna. Are there any um, people of any? substance who is speaking out against that or publicizing it? I mean, I'm on okay. I there is. Okay there's, my visa card. there's articles. Before you, oh yeah, Visa, MasterCard, um, oh, hey, Bobby, talk a, about the mortgage compliance. A lot of, yes, a lot of insurance companies and mortgage companies have to be Sharia compliant, otherwise Muslims will not buy from them because that is one of the commandments. Then we need for Christians not to buy from them. I agree. And there's a lot of these, a lot of these organizations have been boycotted by business that are trying to get people to understand that. I'm going to put out a stack of my business cards and my website is on here. If you go to my website on the bar that has all the different links, it says radio and bio and all that. One of them says articles. I wrote an article that was... Are we financing our own demise? And I want to say I wrote it about five years ago, maybe a little less. Any one of my articles, and Dee and I were talking about this just the other day. It amazes me, you can go back to the very first article I ever wrote too. And if you didn't look at the date, you would think I just wrote it today. This stuff doesn't change, it just gets worse. It's only going to get worse. Yeah. I mean, the country's going down. Joe's arm, sir. Yes, sir. I was getting tired, man. Um, question. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, how many uh, Muslims are there in this country? I realize you have a U.S. Department of what, but I mean, you know, there's, okay, yeah. there's an argument as to how many there Is are. One percent, three percent, five percent. Um. Some people will say it's just under 1%. Okay. To put it into numbers, 
It's probably about a million point eight at this point. Okay, so we have a very, Visa, very small have, number. We have Visa, we have MasterCard, we have all this, but that they're looking at it on a worldwide basis, I guess. Not mm -hmm. looking at it just from the U.S. Court of Appeal. Exactly. The reason these companies are doing that is because they are worldwide. Yeah. Okay. But, but then business is business is business. And like Jamie mentioned, you've got mortgage corporations now, mortgage brokers that are Sharia compliant. So, Dr. Brown, what did it really target? So they get around that by making it Sharia compliant and so on. If you're Muslim, supposedly, you're not supposed to pay any interest. Correct. So, okay, so how? Because they will not write contracts. They can break a contract. Any, that's the other thing. They write a contract with anybody, it's, it's as good as the bed where it's written on. They do not believe in man-made laws. A contract is a man-made law. Uh, so you're saying that the, uh, the whole deal by wrong might not be valid? Well, they haven't signed that anyway. Yeah. You know they haven't signed it yet. Yeah. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter, right? You can't think about it all. Gary, you're joining today at work. Because a big article. I, I heard that, um, and honestly, I never bothered to look at it because I really don't care. Uh, Nancy was asking whether or not Reverend Wright from Obama's old church in Chicago, some, yeah, some she had heard that he was a former Muslim. Um, given the way he preaches and the things he says, it wouldn't surprise me, but I never bothered to research it. I can if you want, but you know. That's, that's, said, that's a quick Google. Did you say Exactly. That's what you just told us now. Is that black theology? Exactly. Black theology? Black theology. Yeah. Liberation. exactly. What would it take? Um, it seems to me that maybe the first step uh, for us to get this turned around would be to get back to that journalistic organization, what would it take to turn them back to, back to publishing the unbiased papers? You know, right now, the biggest problem that we have in the United States is there's really, unless you're on social media, there is one news outlet that sometimes might tell you the truth, and even they're getting a little bit skewed, and that's Fox News. You're, you're not going to change the media. The media has always been on the left side, and that's not going to change. And as long as the left is marching in beat, like John had said, with Islam, you're not going to change that. Glenn Beck, part of the reason Glenn Beck is no longer on Fox News is because of the things he wanted to say, and they wouldn't let him. So, you know, how Sean Hannity has managed to get around it, I was a guest on his show, I don't know. But he gets away with a lot more on his radio show than he does on his TV show. Because that's, that's not affiliated with the Fox Network as much as the TV. Yes. So, what's your opinion on this? A friend who's a psychotherapist uh -oh. says, I'm complaining about burying our heads in the sand. She said, I don't think it's burying our heads. She said, I think it's going to a bunker. She said, I think everyone's hearing enough to scare the dickens out of them. And that's why they put the bunker around them. They don't. I've told friends that there's already been a beheading in, in America, and they, they, they can't believe me. Because it got covered up so quick. You know, the reason they're like, don't tell me anymore, don't tell me anymore. And I'm like, it's the, it's the, how, so how are we going to spread more word? I'm trying, but these people, I mean, they shut down so fast. I wrote an article. I, I really urge everybody to go to my website, so please grab a card because the web address is on there as well as, well as the radio show. Um, I wrote an article where I broke down people. No, it was a video. I did a video where I broke down people to different categories of how to talk to them and who you could talk to. Because there are those where it's like, don't even waste your breath. No matter what you say, no matter how you say it, they are not going to listen. They don't want to hear it. They'll either turn you off or argue with you. There is no changing their mind. And then there's the people that are on the fence. That's, that's what I call them. They're closer to what I think. They'll listen to you, and they can be educated. There's people below those that are on the fence that have enough of an open mind, they may fight you on it, depending on whether they're liberal or not, because somehow this became a partisan issue, 
because all of us, you know, conservatives, we're all racist and just hate Muslims. No, that's got nothing to do with it. So I, I did that, look up that video, um, I forget what it's called, but go watch my videos, because I break that down. I have some of them, I had not seen that one. You, you're not going to be able to convince everyone, just like on anything, that you are right, and they may be mistaken. It's a lot easier, and this is what America has done, this is what our administration huh? has done. Huh? It's a lot easier to say, you know that thing that happened in Orlando, he was a homophobe, and he attacked a gay bar, and then saying, everybody gets scared because we got terrorists here! The difference between America and Israel. Israel and 